computer science at the University of Toronto, and he had this fresh, groundbreaking result with some of uh, our uh, our uh, visitors from Simons, uh, showing that MIP star equals RE, and he will talk about related uh, results of multiple rule protocols, and he will hopefully get us some insights about this new result as well. So, thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Andres. Um, uh, good morning. So thanks for coming to my talk, um, and thanks to the organizers for uh, setting up this wonderful uh, workshop. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, multi-prover protocols, um, and uh, there's, there's two main things that I, I'd like to convey in, in this talk and the next. Um, so the first is, is kind of a general theme, um, and, uh, which is that multi-prover protocols are a very useful lens uh, on many different topics, you know, complexity theory, cryptography, and, uh, and more. Um, and, and this is sort of like a, a shameless riff off of a theme that I like very much, which is um, you know, the computational lens on the sciences, which I think uh, comes from Berkeley. So. Um, and, and the second uh, thing that I want to convey is uh, more concrete. It's uh, uh, you know, something called uh, rigidity or, or self-testing. And uh, it's a, a very simple but powerful tool, um, uh, and, and I'll, I'll get to that. Okay, so, so let's start with the, the model. Um, what is a multi-prover protocol? Okay. Um, well, the, the setup is this. There, there are two devices. You know, they're, uh, well, think of them as black boxes. Um, in this case, PowerPoint makes them blue, but uh, they're, you know, we know nothing about them. They're completely opaque. Um, and uh, the question is, what can the, the PI, uh, which stands for polynomial time investigator, obviously, uh, learn from these two devices okay. uh, through classical interaction only. And these devices are uh, described by quantum mechanics, we know that, um, and they can't signal to each other. So, you know, think of them, the devices being put in separate rooms. And um, here's some things that our uh, polynomial time investigator might wonder about. Okay. Um, you know, the, she might wonder, are these boxes uh, performing a quantum computation correctly? Um, are they generating secure random bits? Or maybe are, are they holding a ground state of a local Hamiltonian? Or maybe more ambitious questions such as, uh, are they capable of solving the halting problem? Or uh, maybe they're, are they using infinite dimensional entanglement? So, so these are rather bold questions. Um, and it turns out, uh, amazingly, all of these uh, questions are checkable, are verifiable using multi-prover protocols. So here's the, the mental model that uh, we should try to have when thinking about these protocols. Okay. So uh, we think of our PI as a uh, computationally limited verifier. Okay. It's, uh, you know, she runs in polynomial time. Uh, she can only perform uh, classical computations. Um, and these devices, uh, we think of them as provers. Okay. They're more computationally powerful than our uh, verifier. Uh, and they're trying to convince this skeptical verifier of some claim X. And some examples of this uh, claim might be maybe some integer is a product of two primes. Okay. Uh, this statement X could also be the boxes are generating secure random bits. Uh, or maybe that a quantum circuit C accepts with high probability. So these claims are something that uh, you know, the, the verifier is interested in, in determining. Uh, but the verifier by uh, itself cannot uh, maybe solve on its own. So instead, the, the verifier will uh, perform an interactive protocol with these uh, two provers, these two devices, uh, to determine if X is true. And uh, we'd like to you know, carry out protocols that satisfy two properties. Uh, one is completeness. If this claim X is indeed true, then there should be a way that these provers uh, can convince the, the verifier of this fact with high probability. And the second property is soundness. If X is actually false, then there's nothing the provers can do to convince uh, this verifier. <coughs> and, you know, if we're just, you know, when thinking about this, it's very useful to sort of, uh, you know, ascribe the following goals 
uh, of the provers and verifier. So this verifier wants to verify X using the, the fewest assumptions. Um, and the provers, uh, you know, they want to convince the verifier of a statement X, even if it's not true. And the, you know, the goal is to design a protocol that, uh, uh, you know, where the verifier can still check the, the correctness or the truth of X. All right, so, so I mentioned this uh, multi-prover lens. Um, and at first sight, you know, this multi-prover model might seem very abstract and uh, maybe uh, a, a little contrived. Um, but uh, multi-prover protocols has allowed us to learn uh, many valuable lessons in, in each of these uh, you know, different areas. In cartography, complexity theory, um, foundations of quantum mechanics, and, and also in uh, turns out in pure mathematics. Um, so, you know, the, the reason it, it, it's so useful is, is because it's a really nice sandbox to explore many different uh, uh, concepts, um, you know, how they play with each other. For example, um, you know, how does quantum entanglement interact with complexity theory? And how does it interact with, say, privacy and, and say, local Hamiltonians? Um, and, and it also connects to things that don't have, you know, seemingly nothing to do with uh, devices or, or physics, you know, such as, you know, functional analysis or or uh, operator algebras. Um, so, so in this talk and, and in the next, I'll, you know, it's sort of broken into two parts. Um, in in this, this first hour, I'll, I'll talk about something, uh, sort of a simple example of uh, rigidity um, and show how, uh, as an application, it can be used to give a very simple interactive proof for quantum computation. Okay, and, and this will sort of illustrate a lot of the, the techniques and, and ideas uh, that go into thinking about uh, multi-prover protocols. Um, and in the second half, uh, I'll talk about some more advanced uh, examples of this rigidity phenomenon um, and show how it can lead to uh, application um, to the complexity of MIP star. So let's, let's start with um, something simple, which is we would like to have classical verification of quantumness, just quantum behavior. So, in some sense, uh, multi-prover protocols uh, originate not from uh, computer science, um, but actually, you know, from physics in, in the earliest uh, 20th century. So, uh, in 1935, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, uh, you know, asked the following question. They said, if you had two boxes, you know, and they're, they're separated far apart from each other, um, and uh, these boxes are, say, behaving according to the laws of quantum mechanics, um, and these boxes uh, receive uh, inputs X and Y, okay? Um, and we assume that since the boxes are separated, um, you know, this box, for example, has no idea what this input X is, and this box has no idea what input Y is. Uh, the boxes produce outputs A and B. And, um, you know, they ask, can the input and output behavior of these two boxes be described by classical physics? And, uh, you know, 30 years later, Bell gave a resounding answer uh, to this question. Uh, he says no. And sort of the modern interpretation of his answer is, is through the multi-prover protocol. And it's uh, very simple to describe. And I'll describe it uh, through something called the, the magic square game. And uh, this is a very simple game. So, so we think of a three by three grid of uh, binary variables, x1 up to x9. And uh, these variables have to satisfy the, the following six constraints. So the, the parity of uh, every row has to be zero. Okay. Uh, and the parity of these first two columns have to be zero as well. Um, but if you add up these uh, three variables in the last column, uh, they should sum up to one. So it's uh, very easy to see that um, there's no way of choosing zeros and ones for these variables to satisfy all of these constraints. This is not a satisfiable uh, constraint satisfaction problem. Uh, and uh, you know, so that's the first thing to notice. Um, and we can sort of take this constraint satisfaction problem and turn it into a game with, uh, that we can play with these two devices. And the way we play this game is, uh, to the first box, we're going to pick a random constraint. So this corresponds to picking a random row or a random column. Uh, and so in this case, for example, we're going to pick the first column and uh, give the first column to this box, so x1, x4, x7. 
And to the second box, we're going to pick a uh, random uh, variable in this constraint, so uh, in this case, x4. And what we're going to ask from these boxes is to uh, give an assignment of bits to each of the variables that they received. So this first box should tell us uh, what the assignment uh, you know, a1, a4, a7 to these variables should be. Uh, and this second box should just give us one bit out. And in this game, uh, you know, they, they win this game if uh, their answers satisfy the following conditions, which is that, um, you know, this, this box, when it outputs these three bits, it should satisfy the constraint. In this case, the sum of these uh, three bits should uh, be equal to, I guess, zero in this case because right, it corresponds to the first column. And there should also be a consistency constraint, which is that um, when this box outputs this bit B, it should match uh, A4, right? because that's the variable that they have in co uh, common. OK, so, so that's the game. Hopefully uh, it makes sense. Um, and I mentioned that this constraint satisfaction problem is not satisfiable. So what does it mean about uh, uh, this game? So if these devices were behaving classically, um, you know, you can think of it as uh, they're behaving deterministically, then there's no way for them to uh, satisfy both of these constraints all the time. Okay? There is no winning strategy that wins perfectly for these two devices. Um, and so we, you, know, you can calculate that their maximum probability of winning is at most uh, 17 over 18, so something less than one. And, uh, Oh, why can't they say zero? So, uh, so if this box always outputs zero, then it's sort of assi it's assigning zeros to all of these variables, right? But in order for that uh, that to match this box, this box also has to out output zeros all the time. But when it, for example, receives this last column, if you know if it outputs zero zero zero, it's not going to satisfy the constraint that these bits sum up to one. So there's always going, you know, there's always going to be a constraint that's violated um, if they use a deterministic strategy. Was there another question? This should be equal to zero in the winning condition. Yes, yeah, uh, that, there's a typo there. Yeah. Okay, so so that's uh, you know the analysis of classical boxes, but quantum mechanics tells us there's uh, some strange behavior that can happen uh, if these boxes share a quantum entangled state. So uh, in particular, by sharing uh, four entangled qubits, two on each side, there's a, a strategy for these devices to win this magic square game to satisfy these conditions with probability one. So there's some spooky behavior going on. And uh, you know, what is this, this strategy? Well, it's, it's not too difficult. Uh, these two devices can share two EPR pairs. Right? So an EPR pair is the maximally entangled state on, on two qubits, so we have two of those. And uh, when, you know, for example, when this box receives the name of a variable, it's going to make a measurement on its uh, two qubits according to uh, what this, uh, you know, three by three grid of measurement uh, tells you. So, so, for example, if this box gets uh, x4, it's going to measure its two qubits using the observable, uh, you know, identity tensor uh, sigma z. It tames a bit and it reports that bit as its assignment. And when this box, you know, gets the three variables, it'll perform, you know, all the measurements dictated by this column on its uh, two qubits and, and report all of the, um, the three bits. And you can sort of run through the calculation, and uh, it turns out that, you know, performing the uh, this quantum strategy allows them to win this game with probability one even though there's no way to deterministically satisfy all the constraints. So there's some you know, spooky behavior going on. And importantly, these two devices, uh, you know, even though they're sharing quantum entanglement, they you know, aren't allowed to you know, signal to, to each other. And uh, OK, so, so what this gives us is an experimental test for non-classical physics. right? Uh, this magic square game and, and many other types of games like it are, are called bell tests. And, um, you know, so, so one way you can run this experiment is, well, you just have these uh, two devices. 
Um, and you just play this magic square game with them. Okay. And if the devices are consistently winning this game, this gives you strong evidence uh, that their behavior cannot be described by uh, classical physics. And in fact, this is something that uh, has been carried out experimentally uh, many times over the years. And this, this, for example, is a picture of uh, you know, the layout of a Bell test uh, that, that was run uh, you know, a few years ago in, uh, in the Netherlands. And so here's, here's the, the two boxes, A and B, and this is the, the verifier that sends the two questions to these uh, two devices. Okay, so, so that's, that's very cool. Um, but there's something stronger that we can say, which is that you know, if you assume that these devices are dis properly described by quantum mechanics, then there's essentially only a, a unique uh, quantum strategy uh, for them to win this particular game with probability one. And this is uh, what I call rigidity. So here's a, a theorem. So if you have you know, these two devices, they share some entangled state, psi, and they're performing some measurements inside. And uh, with this state and measurements, they're winning this game with probability one. Then, in fact, there's a local change of basis. There's a way in which, you know, you can choose a reference frame for each of these two uh, devices, where under that basis change, this state looks like two copies of the EPR pair, and the, the measurements that they're making are the, the ones that I wrote down in the previous slide. They're performing these poly X and Z measurements on these EPR pairs. So in, there, in some sense, there's, there's nothing else that they can be doing uh, other than maybe just choosing a, a different uh, basis for, uh, you know, a reference frame for their, for their measurement. Uh, was there something special about the exact setting of, you know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 1 uh, for the parodies or any kind of parodies you want would also work? Good uh, question. Um, I'm not sure if all possible uh, setting. I don't think all possible settings works. Okay. But um, for example, uh, I had you know five zeros and one one. You could also do you know three zeros in the columns and ones on the the bottom. That's there's some freedom there. Okay. Um, right. So. So you know you, you you play this test with the devices. Not only uh, you know if they're winning with probability one, not only do you know that they're behaving non-classically, but in fact they must be using this specific quantum strategy. And you know this is it's uh, somewhat simple, but um, a very powerful idea. Um, it gives us uh, what's you know we call a classical leash on, on quantum systems. Uh, and um, you know, so so I said this phenomenon is called rigidity, right? The the game is somehow rigid. It's it's forced into behaving a certain quantum way, um, and you know, in the literature, it's also called self-testing. Um, and uh, these rigidity properties of protocols like Magic Square and, and other games like the CHSH or GHZ, um, they're at the heart of many quantum multi-prover protocols. And in fact, uh, advances in, in uh, developing more rich rigidity phenomenon leads to advances in, in designing protocols, uh, more advanced protocols. So, um, so you know, testing for you know certifying two qubits is nice. You know, you can play this game, and you know these devices are are sharing two qubits of entanglement. Um, but what if you wanted to certify many more qubits of entanglement? Um, so, you know, a natural idea is if you wanted to certify n qubits of entanglement, well, why not play many copies of this magic square game, right? So you can play n independent uh, instances of the magic square game with uh, these two boxes. And it turns out you can prove that um, this repeated game uh, also certifies uh, entanglement between the two devices. And in fact, it's going to certify that, uh, you know, the devices have two n EPR pairs shared between them. And uh, the measurements that they're making are really going to be a tensor product of these poly x and poly z uh, on the uh, EPR. If you just see that they're winning with probability one minus epsilon, which is indistinguishable from this, depending how often you're trying it, then how, how much do you know about n? That's a great question. So it's, it's a question of how, uh, so the question is, 
you know, suppose that, uh, you know, how can you ever tell that these devices are winning with probability one? Um, you can only sort of uh, test that they're winning with probability close to one. Uh, what can you guarantee? Uh, so it, if they're winning with probability one minus epsilon, then um, their strategy must be, uh, it, you know, epsilon times n close to this optimal strategy. And so this is something I'll get uh, to before. So there's some robustness statement. Um, the robustness of this particular game is not so great. And actually, this is something I'll uh, get into uh, later. Uh, but there is something you can say in the 1 minus epsilon. Right. So um, good. So, so you know, we, using this, this simple game, we have a way of testing for, for lots of entanglement between these two devices. And in, in fact, we can say precisely what that entanglement is and what they're doing. So, so that was a test for, uh, you know, class of, classical verification of uh, some quantum behavior, uh, just you know having entanglement, but uh, we can lift this to uh, classical verification of quantum computations uh, in the multi-prover setting. But this is a long-standing problem, which is, uh, you know, if you build a quantum computer, can it efficiently prove its correctness? to a classical verifier. Um, and uh, before 2012, uh, the best results uh, used semi-classical verifiers. Right? We had interactive protocols where uh, a verifier could determine whether some devices were performing a quantum computation correctly. But they always relied on the verifier having some small quantumness uh, uh, get into it. Um, but what if you wanted just a purely uh, classical verifier? Right? So, in uh, 2012, uh, uh, Ben, Falk, and Umesh had this beautiful result, which is, uh, turns out you, you can do this, you can accomplish this uh, in, uh, in the multi-prover setting. They gave a classical multi-prover protocol for, uh, for quantum computations. Uh, and um, you know, some years later, before uh, Ermola came up uh, with a protocol that used only one prover. Um, but the, you know, the first time that we, we were able to have a, a purely classical verifier was, uh, uh, was in 2012 with, uh, with multi-provers. So this result, uh, which I'll call RUV, um, you know, had many beautiful ideas. Uh, it uh, introduced uh, uh, you know, rigidity for testing for many qubits. It analyzed the sequential CHSH gain, and it, it sort of uh, exploited a lot of the techniques that we use uh, very often in, in the analysis of multi-prover protocols today. For example, interleaving rigidity tests with uh, tests for computation um, and combining rigidity with uh, measurement-based computation. And putting all these ideas together, uh, you know, you're able to come up with a protocol for, for certifying um, quantum computation, which is just a classical verifier. And it, it's, it's quite a, a, a tour de force, you know, it's, a, it's 100 pages, um, you know, the protocol itself is, uh, you know, it's, it's efficient, but, you know, in order to certify a, a, a T-gate circuit, you, the prover needs to run for T to the 8,000 time, so uh, totally not uh, practical, and it, it has many rounds of, of interaction, um, but it's, it's still the first. Um, and I won't uh, explain you know, how RUV works, but I'll explain in sort of a, a simplification, which is due to Alex Grillo, who's sitting right there. Um, and it's, it's a verification protocol. It's a multi-prover. Uh, and it's, it's much simpler than, uh, than RUV. It's uh, distilled down to 20 pages. It's a one-round protocol. And uh, you know, maybe more importantly, I can describe it to you in this talk. And, uh, but it, you know, explaining the protocol will uh, sort of illustrate a lot of the ideas that um, RUV pioneered. Okay. So, so here's the setup. You know, we have our polynomial time investigator, and she's wondering, there's some circuit I'm really interested in, this quantum circuit. Um, I don't have a quantum computer, but I'm wondering if I ran this on a quantum computer and I measured the first qubit of the circuit, does it measure to one with high probability? Does this circuit accept? Uh, so it can't do it itself, so instead it talks to uh, these two quantum devices. Um, 
<clears throat> these provers are trying to prove that the output of the circuit is one with high probability, even if it isn't. And if it isn't, you know, hopefully the verifier can catch uh, this, this lock. So um, you know, again, we have to have a protocol that satisfies completeness. Uh, if the circuit accepts with high probability, then the prover should be able to convince the verifier of this case. Um, otherwise, the verifier should reject. And also, uh, you know, very importantly, we're uh, interested in prover efficiency. Right. We want these boxes to be implementable in the real world. So we, you know, whatever they're doing to, to run this protocol, to convince this verifier of this fact, it should be able to do this in, in quantum polynomial time. Okay. So to, to do this, let's uh, you know, kind of think about an easier setting. Right. Actually, back to the semi-classical uh, setting. So let's imagine that our verifier here has a, a trusted measurement device. So it's, it's a, a device that can receive quantum states, uh, and it takes as an input an untrusted state psi. Okay. We know nothing about psi. Um, but the, the verifier can command this device to perform uh, measurements of each qubit in either the x or z basis. And the, the verifier here trusts this device to do that properly. And uh, you know, when it measures, it reports the measurement outcomes back to the verifier. Um, so you know, this seems like kind of a, a simple device. It's not doing much. It's just making single qubit measurements. Uh, but this is enough for the verifier to check arbitrary BQP computations. And uh, you know, what's the idea behind this? Well, let's, let's, uh, it uses something called the, the feynman gataev uh, circuit to Hamiltonian construction which is a, an efficient mapping from uh, a quantum circuit C to a local Hamiltonian H uh, that uh, essentially encodes uh, the, the computation. Right. So the ground state of this Hamiltonian uh, H uh, is something called a history state. Right. This will be uh, some state psi that's a superposition over all intermediate stages of this computation of the circuit. So if the circuit has uh, size T, then uh, over all times t, we have the state of the circuit at, at that time. That's the, going to be the ground state of, of this Hamiltonian. And uh, it turns out that um, there are circuit to Hamiltonian constructions where this, these Hamiltonians uh, have a very nice form. It turns out that with, without loss of generality, we can assume that each of these uh, Hamiltonian terms are tensor products of uh, x and z measurements. Right. And, and what do we know about this uh, circuit to Hamiltonian transformation? Suppose the, the output of the circuit uh, is 1 with, let's say, probability 1. Then uh, this history state that I just described has zero energy. It's, it's a, a zero energy uh, a, a state of this local Hamiltonian. On the other hand, if the circuit uh, accepts a probability less than 1 thirds, then uh, if you uh, look at the uh, average energy of this, of any state, actually, uh, with respect to this Hamiltonian, it's at least uh, 1 over poly n, where n is the, the number of qubits in this circuit. In other words, the minimum eigenvalue of this Hamiltonian is, is uh, at least 1 over polynomial uh, in, this, in the size of this circuit. So, so there's a gap in the, the minimum eigenvalue. It's either 0 or, or something separated from 0. Uh, but in fact, we're, uh, you know, we can boost this minimum eigenvalue to something uh, noticeable, one half. Uh, and this uses some, uh, a simple Hamiltonian amplification trick. This uh, results in a non-local Hamiltonian, but that's OK. Uh, we're not so worried about that. Um, and this non-local Hamiltonian will still only be you know, polynomially bigger than the original Hamiltonian. Uh, so, so this is the guarantee that we have uh, about this Hamiltonian. OK, so let's go back to this trusted measurement uh, setup. Uh, so here's the measurement protocol to verify a computation. Right. So this, this verifier knows the circuit. It's going to compute this uh, Hamiltonian from the circuit. Uh, and this trusted measurement device gets some state. You know, maybe it's the ground state. Maybe it's some other state. Um, and the verifier will command this device to measure a random Hamiltonian term HF. 
and it, it measures the state and it reports the measurement outcomes. And uh, the verifier will accept if the outcomes correspond to uh, the kernel of, of this uh, random term. So, so why is this a, a good verification protocol? Right. So if we're in the yes case, meaning that this original circuit uh, accepted with probability one, then by providing a history state of this computation to this trusted measurement device, it will always report that this state is uh, you know, uh, in the kernel of, of this term, uh, and so this verify will always accept. Uh, whereas uh, in the no case, any state uh, sign that's provided to this trusted uh, measurement device uh, is always uh, going to um, you know, measure with some non-zero uh, energy noticeable probability. And the verifier will re reject with uh, probability at least a half. So that just comes from the guarantees of uh, what our Hamiltonian gives us. So, but your, your Hamiltonian, I was, I was actually so confused. It's the sum of the HIs? Yeah. Yeah, uh, good. So uh, yeah, it's the sum of the HIs. Um, and the guarantee here is that if we pick a random term and uh, measure the energy, yeah, so okay. I guess Thank I lost it. And it's uh, going to have energy at least uh, half. Do you say why one third is the cutoff to make this work? Uh, one third is somewhat arbitrary, as, as long as it's, it's uh, separated from one by some noticeable amount. Okay, so uh, you know, assuming our verifier has this uh, nice measurement device, it, it can verify DGP computations. Um, but uh, you know, we you know, in this multi-prover setting, we don't have a, a trusted measurement device. So, so what can we do? Um, well, we're going to use rigidity to our advantage. Right. So we're going to what this now purely classical verifier is going to do. It's going to force one of these provers to act as a trusted measurement device. <coughs> and uh, in this you know, analysis protocol, it's very simple. With probability one half, the verifier performs a, a rigidity test. It's going to perform, play these n uh, magic square games like I described before. Okay. And uh, you know, when, you, when you play this game and you know, these devices pass with high probability, what can you uh, guarantee about these devices? Well, first, they, they must share many EPR pairs. Right? And, and they're performing these x and z measurements. Uh, as you, you want them to. So that's one half of the test. The other half is the verifier performs an energy test. Right. Now that we know one of the devices is a, a trusted measurement device, we can get it to, to measure uh, a state uh, with a basis choice uh, of our choosing. And uh, in this energy test, what this other prover is going to do, this prover A, it's going to teleport a state psi, hopefully the ground state, to prover B. And the verifier is going to ask prover B to measure this. So, so let me say some more details about this, this energy test. Well, the, the verifier is first going to pick uh, some number of EPR pairs. So okay, let me set some parameters here. So n is the, the number of qubits of our, our ground state. And we're going to pick capital N to be larger than little n. So think of it as like n squared. So the, the verifier is going to pick uh, uh, some subset of little n EPR pairs. And then it's going to tell prover A to teleport some state psi through these EPR pairs to prover B. And uh, if you remember, when you perform quantum teleportation, uh, there's a measurement outcome okay. that corresponds to uh, poly errors on the, the resulting teleported state. Okay. So we call those teleportation keys. And this prover will report the teleportation keys uh, to the, the verifier. At least, you know, the, the, that's what the verifier is hoping. We don't actually know what prover A is doing. It could, you know, just report a ran, you know, completely random a string k of, uh, that has nothing to do with teleportation, but uh, it's going to report some uh, key k. Uh, and uh, ideally, these keys should indicate the x and z errors on, on each of the teleported qubits. So in the ideal case, 
some teleportation happens, and the state that's sitting on uh, proof of B side is, is going to be the state psi with the, these errors. OK, so, so now the verifier is going to turn to prover B, and it's going to pick a random Hamiltonian term HI. It's going to pick a random basis string, R, that's just Xs and Zs, for each of the big N EPR pairs. And it's going to hide this Hamiltonian term HI, which we can assume is just uh, specifying X and Z measurements, into this random string R. So, for example, let's imagine that HI is, um, you know, saying we want to perform measurement sigma X, sigma Z, sigma Z. Uh, then uh, in wherever this random subset S is indicating, it's going to hide uh, HI into those, those locations. So let's, you know, only prover A knows the subset S. Prover B has no idea. Then... The verifier is going to tell prover B to measure all of its EPR pairs, all capital N of its EPR pairs, uh, using this basis R, and report the measurement outcomes. And uh, ideally, the measurement outcomes, when you restrict to this random subset S, it should correspond to measuring this, uh, you know, this modif this teleported state uh, with this Hamiltonian term. That and then uh, this verifier can decode this measurement using the, the keys k. And except if the outcomes correspond to, again, the, the kernel of HI. So essentially what the verifier has done is, is asked uh, this prover to measure the state psi using this HI. Okay, so... Before I you know, describe why it works, any questions about what's uh, going on in this program? Is there some redundancy? Like the Zs are not going to change the energy. Uh, the kernel um, the is the uh, null space, I guess you for things that are zero eigenvalue. Right. It doesn't seem like the Z operators would change the energy. Uh, so it depends if the, the Hamiltonian, you know, if, you know, let's say for this qubit, if the, the Hamiltonian term was, uh, uh, say, sigma x, then I, I think the z would cause a bit flip. So, uh, so if the key says that there was a z error, then, uh, uh, then the verifier should flip the, the bit, the measurement outcome. I guess when you commute them through, there will be some z's left that don't matter, but before commuting, it matters. Okay. I have a basic question. Yeah. You said uh, this protocol is a single round. Um, this is, th this means, you know, a message from the verifiers to the prover and then back, and that's it? That's it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So I, I sort of described it in a two-step process, you know, first talking to prover A, then talking to prover B. All of it can be done simultaneously. Okay. So, so why does this, this work? Um, okay, so let's think about the yes case. Let's say that the circuit C actually accepted with probability 1. Well, then, then there really is some ground state, this history state with zero energy. And, uh, you know, we know that the prover B performs this uh, measurement protocol honestly. Uh, you know, or, you know, if, if it you know, performs this uh, measurement protocol honestly, then the verifier will always accept. Okay, that's, uh, that's easy to see. Um, let's, let's, you know, analyze the converse. Suppose the provers succeed with probability 1 minus epsilon. So this is getting to uh, what you were asking. Well, then, since it's performing two tests with probability half, then it must be, the provers must pass each test with probability at least 1 minus 2 epsilon. So think of epsilon as very small. So in particular, it passes this rigidity test. Uh, and what do we know about prover B? Um, well, it must be some polynomial in n times epsilon close to this ideal trusted measurement device. And also, this shared state is, is uh, close to being a tensor product of EPR pairs. And here's the key fact. Prover B cannot tell the difference between a rigidity and energy test. 
That's very important. Right? It shouldn't be able to know if you know, it's supposed to be verifying this computation or trying to pass these n magic square games. So uh, if, it wants, if this prover B wants to do well, then it has to behave the same in, in both. So, so we know that if it passes the rigidity test, prover B must be a trusted measurer in both tests. Okay, so now we have a foothold. Now we, when we go to this energy test, uh, well, prover A knows which test it's playing, right? It's either playing the magic square games or it's being told to teleport something, okay? So it can easily distinguish. But that's okay. No matter what prover A is doing, right, it's going to report some keys. So fix a key K. There's some you know, residual state of the, the entire system. We know that uh, prover B is passing this trusted measurement protocol with high probability. That's by assumption. And what this tells us is that this Hamiltonian H actually has a ground energy that's close to zero. But I gave you this promise. This energy was either zero or at least a half. Okay, so, so it actually must be zero. And what this means is that this circuit must accept uh, with probability one. So, you know, putting everything together, this, this uh, you know, the completeness we uh, we determined if the circuit does accept, there's a, the verifier will always accept. If the circuit does not accept with probability, uh, uh, with high probability, then, then no matter what the provers do, then uh, the verifier will reject with uh, inverse polynomial probability. But you know, there's a way to amplify it so that the, all prover strategies are rejected with high probability. And the prover complexity is, uh, is polynomial in the size of the circuit it wants to verify. And the, the number of rounds is one. That complexity grows with the depth of the circuit too, right? Because the number of Hamiltonian terms in the map, mapping grows with the depth. Right. So there's another hidden cost in this. So here, we're, yeah, we're not very careful. We actually, we just assume each layer has only one gate. So uh, the depth would be the number of gates. But, but if you have a real circuit with lots of multi-qubit operations, this is going to grow very rapidly. That's right. Yeah. Oh. So uh, it's, it's still not practical. You know, what is the polynomial here? It's, um, it's better than, you know, t to the 8,000. I think it's more like t cubed or something. Yeah. But, but I don't agree. I think if you have multi-qubit gates, it affects the locality of the Hamiltonian, but not how many terms you have. Like, it's how big they are. But the, the, the uh, I think I'll agree with that, but the depth of the circuit also increases the number of terms because yeah, you need yeah. the clock. It's a trivial or bottleneck, right? Like the number of gates is at least the depth. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, previously you made a comment about uh, the magic square game not having good robustness properties. I was wondering if you could expand on that because you were showing some one minus epsilon, one minus two epsilon, polyam. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just more than that. that's, uh, yeah, that's a um, good thing to. So, so, in order for this closeness guarantee to to make any sense or to be non-trivial, this epsilon has to be very small. It has to be you know smaller than one over n at least. Right. But n is uh, you know the size of this computation. So in order to get any guarantees, we're, we're actually demanding that these two devices uh, pass this test um, with probability very, very close to one. Okay. Um, otherwise, we, we can't say anything. Um, so uh, you know, in terms of um, uh, practical parameters, it's not very useful. But uh, this is just sort of to illustrate how using this, magic, you know, this rigidity test, we can verify the computation, um, say, in polynomial time. But of course, uh, you might want to replace this uh, with a, a more robust um, rigidity test, where the closeness parameter should not depend on n, the, the number of qubits you're certifying. And in fact, that's what I'll talk about in the, the next one. Um, so this worked by using the Feynman Katab construction and then asserting that you could transform it to a Hamiltonian only x and z measurements. Could you use any um, Hamiltonian representation of the circuit, or is it strictly just this representation? Oh, uh, great question. So this is yeah, this was a very generic argument. 
We didn't need that uh, it was um, the, this particular Feynman Kintai of construction. In fact, this is a very generic protocol for verifying ground states of X and Z Hamiltonians. Okay. So like if somebody came out with a much better, more efficient way to encode circuits in Hamiltonians, that would automatically imply an improvement for this protocol? Uh, yes. Okay. I'm just understanding, uh, for the previous game where you have a trusted measurement device, the fact that uh, you challenge it to, or you command it to perform X and Z measurements, is, is that related to the fact that the some of each of the Hamiltonian terms help me also to have that form, or? Yes. Uh, the, re the reason being, like, um, we're appealing to um, the fact that the, the trusted protocol works, um, so we want to simulate it. Um, and, and what we really want to do is we want to measure the energy of this Hamiltonian. And we can only do that if uh, it's in the same language. If there's the Hamiltonian terms are also X and Z. If they were you know, other types of measurements, then it's uh, not immediately clear how you would ask these provers to perform those measurements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I thought that that connected somehow to the, you needed some special additional uh, property from the Feynman Kataev construction as well. Am I misunderstanding? Um, each of the HI terms? Yes. Yeah, that's that's right. one. Yeah. yeah, if they were of a different form, then uh, you may need a different rigidity test that tested for those types of measurements. Okay. Um, so hopefully I uh, got your protocol c correct. Okay. Um, <laughs> great. So let's see. Um, yeah, so just to recap this, uh, you know, this, this first part, uh, this first talk, um, you know, these multi-prover protocols are, you know, they're a very useful framework to study complex quantum systems, uh, you know, one being uh, the, s the state of a quantum computation. And really the, the key thing that drove uh, why, you know, Alex's protocol works and why many uh, of these uh, protocols work is because of rigidity. We were able to establish a classical leash on these quantum systems. We can um, force them to do what we want and, uh, and, and trust their, you know, uh, what they're doing. Uh, Certifying EPR pairs and XZ measurements, you know, it's, uh, by itself doesn't seem like much, but it turns out it's enough to verify arbitrary BQP computations. Um, and uh, in the next talk, uh, I'll, I'll talk about more advanced uh, rigidities, or the frontier of what we can prove about rigidity of uh, these multi-prover protocols, um, and the complexity of multi-prover protocols. Uh, and so, so that's it for this first part. Yes. Just to follow up on the previous discussion, um, is it known that that rigid rigidity for the magic square name is like best possible? It seems like it's just like using a single instance and triangle equality or something like that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if we. I don't think we know whether it's the best possible. Um, okay. So you, it's you know potentially possible that this statement could still hold with without the n. Um, I have two questions, if I may. The, the first is, this is a fully adversarial scenario. Right. Uh, and for practical experimental applications, most experiments aren't terribly adversarial. Right. Uh, what can you say about such situations? Um, so probably much more. Uh, I mean, certainly, we've, we've done this analysis in the adversarial setting. and. I guess first, it's remarkable how much we can say in such a setting. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, in, all the parameters are, are n uh, not practically useful. So um, I think it's a very interesting question to uh, try to um, add in more assumptions, maybe more reasonable assumptions um, about the device and in such multi prover protocols to try to establish stronger guarantees about characterizing the system you have in your lab. Um, so I, I don't know if people actually looked into using um, self-testing to characterize, say, uh, you know, NISC devices or anything. Uh, but I think that's, uh, I find that a very interesting question. The second thing I was thinking is um, this reduction is very reminiscent of the proof of security of quantum key distribution. 
um, because there's testing of uh, devices on that case to ensure that you have EPR pairs in the you know, CSS codes version of the protocol um, between the sender and the receiver, and then you do ECRD 91 or something. Um, and um, in the case of QKD, there's a beautiful reduction when using CSS codes to make it practically realizable. I can see some codes must be hiding around here. If you employed codes instead of the magic square game, um, might you actually be able to uh, simplify some of these measurements, get rid of memories, and reduce it to something more practically realizable? They're familiar with this QKD reduction. Maybe during the break. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear more. So this is a related question. Um, are there lower bounds you know, for how many rounds of communication you need to prove your n qubits are good at T gates? How many, oh, so this is only a single round. Um, okay. Do you mean the, 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 the length of, of communication? Oh, uh, that's a great question. Um, you would think maybe to, to test for a, a size, you know, T circuit, you would need maybe at least T bits. Um, but it uh, turns out, I guess given the, um, the results of the next talk, say, uh, if you can specify your circuit very succinctly, uh, then you don't need uh, as many um, bits of communication. Okay. So regarding the round question, if I understand the protocol right, the verifier sends a message to prover A, prover A responds, and then that response is used in the message to prover B, is that? Oh, uh, right, so um, that's not necessary. It's, it can all be done simultaneously. So the only message from uh, prover A is, is uh, what these keys are, these teleportation keys, mm -hmm. and um, they're only used uh, at the end of the protocol to decode the measurement results of, of what prover B said. I see, but there was some, oh, okay, the embedding is what happened, okay. So the yeah. Sure. Embeds its own. Uh, it, yeah, the embedding just depends on S. Okay, the, the subset. In multi prover protocols, does the strength come from having two provers, or do you get something more from having more than two? Oh, uh, are you saying if you, you have three provers, say, could you do more? Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, certainly, for example, um, you know, by playing, say, like a GHZ game, which is like a tripartite, it's a game with three players, uh, you can certify uh, that the three boxes share the GHZ state, uh, for example. Um, so um, you know, that's something that's sort of native to the three-party setting. Um, whether you can do anything more uh, in terms of um, certifying quantum computations, well, I guess two provers is enough. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, I don't think we now have too many examples where having more parties necessarily uh, helps you. It helps the communication, right? If you have four, then you can do with log uh, communication, I think. To, uh, by, uh, uh, by the result by Anand and Thomas, like this, this uh, using this uh, uh, game version of quantum PCP, uh -huh. I think you can do that to delegate quantum computation with four provers oh, right. and log communication. Uh, right, that, that's true. Um, well, I think we know we can do that with two provers now. No, we don't, uh, we don't know. You know okay. so, so, yeah. In certain cases, having more provers helps you design. Uh, um, yeah. 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 If there are no more questions, that will be a talk and I'll break.